Remember this phone? Now this is the Huawei SNP6, the slimmest phone for its time that tried a little too hard to look like an iPhone. It never felt like it though, but Huawei has come a long way from those days. The P20 Pro was one of the first phones to come out with three cameras. Huawei was the first to debut Force Touch, a technology Apple and Samsung to a more limited extent use these days. Huawei also happened to be the first manufacturer to come to the market with a sapphire screen, or rather sapphire glass covered screen. And the gradient back that you see on Oppo and everyone else today, guess what? Huawei went there first. From being a follower, Huawei seems to be evolving into a market leader. An accumulation of all that hard work, the next step in the process is the release of not one, not two, but three phones recently, the Huawei Mate 20, 20 Pro and 20X. In this video, let's take a look at all the innovations that Huawei has brought about this time. Hey guys, Ash here from c 4 Tech, and let's get started. If you do end up liking this video, please don't forget to turn on notifications by clicking that bell icon. Yeah, I tried different kind of enunciations. Maybe you do it now. Anyway, uh, here's a card to a monthly giveaway. Check that out. Now, I know people tend to take specs for granted, especially when it comes to flagships, but there is something very important, very interesting happening underneath the hood here. Now, there is a race to come up with, you know, lower nanometer uh, chipsets, right? Uh, if a few years back somebody had asked me who'd be the first to seven nanometers, I mean, I would, just like anyone else, had a guest Apple or Qualcomm, you know, hell, maybe Samsung had a chance or maybe even MediaTek, and nobody would have even thought to mention Huawei. I definitely wouldn't have. And guess what? Huawei was the first to it. Okay, it's kind of a murky first. They announced it first, but Apple did come out with a phone with a 7 nanometer chip first, but all that said, it is still an achievement that Huawei got there before Qualcomm or Samsung or even MediaTek. Now, MediaTek might not seem like a big brand and some of you might be wondering why is he even mentioning MediaTek in the same line as a Qualcomm or a Samsung, but MediaTek is huge. They are one of the most popular chip manufacturers and they spend millions and millions on R&D. Anyway, this 7 nanometer high silicon Kirin 980 is what Huawei has used in these phones. It's not just the manufacturing process that's new, even the core split up is quite unique. Unlike most octa-core chips that are split up in a 4 plus 4 core cluster fashion, we have a 4 plus 2 plus 2 in here. So that there are 4 low powered Cortex A55 cores clocked at 1.8 GHz for your basic tasks. Then you have two higher powered Cortex A76 cores which are clocked at 1.92 GHz. And finally, two more Cortex-A76 cores that go all the way up to 2.6 GHz. Now, we haven't gotten our hands on a review unit yet, but from the spec sheet, this looks like it could give some tough competition to the Snapdragon 845s and Exynos 9810s. It's just amazing to see how far Huawei has come. I mean, it used to be compared with MediaTek's mid-end a few years back. Right now, in my humble opinion, if they can get their GPU game sorted, the Kirin chips can better Qualcomm's. For the last two generations, Huawei's CPUs have actually been better. The 960 constantly outperformed uh, the 835 with regards to CPU intense tasks like rendering. The 970 outdid the 845 for the same. And then there are the NPUs. At this point, I do feel the need to point out that we haven't really seen what Samsung is capable of, you know, since unlike Huawei who wanna kind of push their chips to the max, Samsung deliberately cripples their Exynos flagship chips so that they perform similar to the Qualcomm counterparts as they use both chips in their flagship phones and want the performance to be similar across the board. Anyway, all that said, it is not just the processors that make a phone, right? The battery plays quite an important part. Now, Samsung hasn't really pushed battery capacities in the last few years, especially since the Note 7 debacle. Apple has always been far more functionality. Huawei, on the other hand, has been constantly kitting out their flagships with bigger batteries. The Mate 20 has a 4000 mAh battery, same as the Note 9. The Mate 20 Pro has a bigger 4200 mAh battery and the Mate 20X has a gigantic 5000 mAh battery. It's not just battery capacities, Huawei has also stepped up their game when it comes to the charging technology. Huawei Supercharge promises to juice the 4000 mAh battery on the Mate 20 to over 50% in about half an hour. It's even faster on the Mate 20 Pro. 
you know, you're supposed to be able to go to 70% in 30 minutes. That is using the 40 watt uh, Huawei supercharger. Now that's one of the highest uh, charging capacities for a charger. 30 watts on the ROG was quite good. We just saw that phone. Here's a card to that unboxing. 40 watts just feels insane. Oh, and while this is something Samsung has had for ages, Huawei now joins the club with wireless charging on the Mate 20 Pro. Also, well, no doubt this one's a niche feature at best or a gimmick at worst. There is reverse wireless charging on the Mate 20 Pro. Now, it is fresh and new. Maybe you might use it at some point. Basically, the Mate 20 Pro can act as a wireless charger for other devices with smaller capacity batteries, iPhones. Anyway, uh, next up are the cameras. Huawei has done away with the black and white sensor on their triple camera array and instead introduced a new 20 megapixel ultra wide sensor. LG's G series has shown us how handy the ultra wide sensor can be in situations and I can't wait to try this one out myself. Now while LG or Asus, their implementation meant that you kind of lose out on telephoto, on optical zoom. Uh, the 8 megapixel camera on the Mate 20 series makes sure that you get the best of both worlds. It is worth mentioning uh, here that the Mate 20 gets a cut down version of the rear cameras that you see on the Mate 20 Pro and the X. The primary sensor is a 12 megapixel one instead of 40 and you also have a 16 megapixel ultra wide sensor and an 8 megapixel telephoto lens in there. Huawei is also bringing back the AI photography and stabilization features that they debuted with the P20 Pro. Now, on the P20 Pro, it was kind of in your face, but with the Honor phones, which kind of have similar stuff, uh, it hasn't been that in your face recently, the Honor 8X that we unboxed. The AI was good, but it wasn't fair. It was a little subtle. It wasn't so, uh, so different, bumping up saturation levels left, right, and center like it was on the P20 Pro. So maybe Huawei are evolving there, and their camera, uh, the, 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 the DxO Mark scores haven't been broken by the new launches from, be it, Apple or Google. So, I mean, I'm not saying that their video is great. The video definitely requires work. I hope they've kind of upped their video game on this one. But from a still image uh, point of view, the P20 Pro was still leader the last time we checked, right? I mean, Samsung, of course, has their super slow-mo as well as variable aperture tricks. And I think the camera setups on the A7 and the A9 prove that even Samsung is noticing what Huawei is doing and is not minding taking a page out of the Huawei playbook. And now that's saying something. Now, when it comes to screens, Samsung has constantly been the best that's available. They've been producing some high quality AMOLED displays for their flagship phones and even for others. But with regards to the screen to body ratio, Samsung hasn't kind of followed the notch trend. So, I mean, it's been a great decision for the fans, uh, but it has meant that the last two, three generation phones have been quite similar. Yeah, the bezels have shrunk a little and the fingerprint sensor has been moved around a lot. Huawei, on the other hand, though, has embraced the new technology. The Mate 20 has a tiny little dewdrop notch that even the most uh, hardened notch haters can forgive. The Mate 20 Pro, though, does come with a wider notch, though there's good reason for that. It features 3D face unlock, similar to Face ID on Apple devices. But unlike the iPhones, this one doesn't ditch the fingerprint scanner. Huawei has, in fact, included an in-display fingerprint scanner under the OLED screen, so you do get a choice, you know, use face unlock or fingerprint. And this is kind of what I like about Huawei. The choice is wide notch plus face recognition or dew drop notch without it. A choice of screen size, 6.39 inch uh, Quad HD plus OLED panel on the Pro or the gigantic 7.2 inch Full HD plus OLED display on the Mate 20X. A choice of design, color shifting auto rub black or a more muted pastel color with a slightly textured back glass panel. And even a choice of input, the normal touch screen or the M pen. Yes, this is kind of like Samsung's S Pen. It has 4096 pressure sensitivity levels and Huawei claims that it mimics the physical feel of writing something down. Even if it is half as good as the one on the Note 9, Samsung has some serious competition. In fact, the S Pen is one of the main reasons why many professionals and creators stick to the Note lineup and the M Pen could kind of sway a little of these people right over to the Mate 20X. Of course, it's not without its caveats. Huawei isn't perfect. For example, the M Pen is sold separately and there is no place to put it in the phone. So it kind of makes it a competitor to the Apple Pencil more than the S Pen. The biggest annoyance for me with Huawei though is the new nano memory slot. Huawei has introduced it. Uh, they, uh, so instead of micro SD, Huawei features a nano memory card hybrid slot. 
Now they say they work with Toshiba on it, but as of now there are no cards available on sale. And proprietary cards are always bad, especially when they don't bring much to the table. Huawei says this one can do 90 Mbps reads, but microSD can already do that and more. In fact, the top ones, they do much better, right? Remember, with proprietary cards, there's always a higher cost involved. Let's actually turn the clock back a little bit. Think about Sony and their M2 cards. Anybody remember that? I think it's called M2. Maybe I'm wrong, but let me know in the comments. Back in the day, a 256 MB Sony proprietary card would be priced equal to a 2 GB microSD or SD. It was the same with the Sony ProDio as well, the ProDio and SD. And very recently with my primary camera, the Sony FS7, Sony uses XQD cards for it. 128 gigs cost, wait for it, 60,000 rupees when I bought the cam. Later, Lexar started producing the cards and the price dropped 64 gigs for 7,000 rupees. But at least in that case, the read writes were much higher, much faster than SD. So maybe there was a reason for it. It was either the small XQD or going with SSDs, which would have taken a lot more space. But here, I mean, yes, the nano memory cards are a little smaller here, but not by much. Again, not worth paying a lot more. Again, this is all uh, initial uh, thoughts. Maybe Huawei surprises us and come, comes with cheaper than micro SD cards, but I don't think that's gonna happen. Anyway, that misstep apart, Huawei is sticking mostly to the fact that new features can't come at the cost of basic functionality and usability. And that's where I think Huawei is really shining. The Mate 20 series ships with Android Pie out of the box. They take all the boxes you'd expect from a flagship in 2018. As of now, we only have the European pricing. The top Mate 20 Pro is priced at 1050 euros. That means about 89, 90,000 rupees. That said, the P20 Pro was launched for 900 euros, which should have converted to 73, 74,000 rupees, but it came in at 67. So expect a little bit of a lower price, but they are not gonna come cheap. They're gonna be good, but not cheap at all. And that said, if you are sensitive to price, it's not all bad. There is something to excite you, something that really excites me. Here's what it is. Usually Huawei features sooner or later end up coming to the Honor series and they are priced much lower. The Kirin 970 on the P20 Pro made its way over to the Honor Play. 67,000 rupees, 21,000 rupees. Now, as excited as I am to see the new mates, I can't wait to see what trickles down to the new Honor phones. What about you? Are you excited to see these new phones? Do you feel Huawei is becoming a new leader in the market, you know, moving away from being a follower? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. So I guess that's it for this video. Thumbs up, thumbs down based on what you felt about it. Subscribe and turn on notifications by clicking that bell icon. And I guess that's it. Thanks a lot for watching. Till next time, my name's Ash. You've been watching C4 Retech, and I'm signing off for now. You guys have a great day. Bye-bye.